All right, welcome everyone. Glad you've joined us today. My name is Andrea Dalton. I work at University Health, Behavioral Health, and I'm with Metro Council. Metro Council is the Metropolitan Council of Community Mental Health Centers, and Metro Council is a collaborative membership organization representing the public mental health system of community behavioral health centers serving the greater metropolitan Kansas City area. We provide support to our member organizations and we also provide education, information, and resources to the public on accessing quality health services. You might be familiar with us because we host the Mental Health KC Conference every May. And we also provide these free webinars on the second and fourth Thursday of every month. We also have started hosting a fall symposium, which we hosted just last, was that last week? I've lost track. I think it was just last week yeah. time. Uh, and uh, that it's so where you'll start to see uh, those kinds of messaging uh, around those kinds of events going out to you. At the end of the webinar today, we will put the link in the chat uh, along with a password that you'll need in order to get the certificate of attendance for this webinar. And if you're accessing the recording for this webinar, the link and the password to access that will be just right there along with the uh, with the recording. Just a reminder today uh, and always with our Metro Council presentations, the views and opinions presented are those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the opinions of Metro Council. I'm really excited to introduce to you today Laura Ashbaugh. Uh, Laura is my colleague and friend at University Health and she's going to be speaking with us today on women and ADHD, which is uh, a really popular topic given the large number of registrants we had for this webinar today. So uh, I'm excited to learn more about the topic as well. And just to tell you a little bit about Laura, she has a master's degree in clinical psychology, is a licensed professional counselor in Missouri, and is also a nationally certified counselor. She's worked in the field of community mental health for over 15 years. And in that time, she's worked in a crisis stabilization unit, residential facilities, outpatient case management, and an outpatient counseling center. She currently provides clinical and administrative trainings, as well as supervision and mentoring in her role as senior project coordinator at University Health Behavioral Health. She is passionate about finding and utilizing a person's strengths to help them build the life they want. Outside of mental health, she teaches lifespan development psychology and abnormal psych at various community colleges and universities. And in her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her family, seeing movies, and traveling the world. So I'm going to pass it over to Laura. And um, as she's speaking today, you may feel free to type in the chat if you have questions. We also have the Q&A function activated in this webinar, and you're welcome to do that. And Laura, you can just ignore that while you're speaking, and I'm happy to kind of keep track of that if you want, if that helps you uh, kind of manage what's going on. So not a problem. I, I love, I actually like teaching over Zoom. Um, I've, so I've kind of gotten like a little bit of the routine of like, I've got a chat running, I've got this running and kind of, it helps me to keep all the things in my head. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. Thank you very much for that, Andrea. Um, I love talking about this topic. It's very, um, I've learned a lot. I'm excited to share about it. And it's also very personal to me as well. So I'm going to share my screen and we are going to look here at some PowerPoints. Truthfully, mostly it's for keep, help me keep, keep me on track than it is really for anything else. So as Andrea mentioned, I'm Laura Ashbaugh. Um, I work at University Health. I teach at Longview Community College, and I do a lot of different things in the field. Um, this particular presentation I have done at a few of the conferences that she mentioned, so I'm really excited to do it here um, to provide the information for people who are unable to attend those conferences. So a couple of things we'll talk about, and um, what I'm hoping you walk away with today is these ideas that there is a difference in symptom presentation between, between men and women. It's not that they have different types, it's that the symptoms present themselves differently. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those differences as well as some of the social differences in diagnosis. Um, so it's not just how it presents, but how we as a society view uh, behaviors and symptoms and how we interpret them through our own lenses and through our own systems and biases. And then ultimately, I do wanna talk about some of the behavioral techniques to help cope. I will be very upfront. This presentation is a little bit more about diagnosis and symptoms and a little less about what we can do about it. 
Um, those are two very big topics. I try to hit at least a little bit of walking away with some suggestions, ideas, and different places for uh, resources as well. As Andrea mentioned, please do not hesitate to drop a question in the chat or drop a question in the q and I love questions. I will do my very best to pay attention to time as this is a topic I can talk about for a long time um, and I get pretty excited about. Um, so in terms of the, where we're going to go, where we're going to do, and I really want to think about the idea of caution. Right? So this is one topic. Um, it's a very uh, very timely one. I see a lot of conversations about ADHD, particularly in women. I do want you to be careful about a couple of things. Um, one, do be careful about self-diagnosis. Some of the symptoms, as with many um, disorders, are going to be similar to our experience, maybe not quite to the level of diagnosis. So with all things, there needs to be distress. There needs to be um, deficits in our life. There needs to be those challenges that it's affecting our life in a negative way to truly equal a diagnosis. Um, so do be careful of self-diagnosis, although I do have a lot of people come up to me afterwards and say, this speaks to my experience. This helps explain a little bit of the struggles I've had throughout my own life um, and offering that perspective. So I do think just being aware of that and also be careful of using language boy or girl ADHD. There is no such thing as a boy ADHD or a girl ADHD. It's more, here is ADHD and here is how it often shows up in girls and here is how it often shows up in boys. But that is um, almost a, I wanna say a fake or a unfair delineation. We don't have enough information about non-binary. I do use the terms male, female, boy, girl, I do use the more binary experience of gender, um, mostly because we just don't have enough research on what it looks like in those with a, bi a non-binary experience. So even though I say boy, girl, men, women, this really does represent a whole spectrum of people's experience on, within the spectrum of gender. And it's not boys have it this way, girls have it this way. It's just looking at it from a different lens and understanding how that is typical for particular presentations and people's experiences. So just kind of having said all of that. And the other thing I will also note about this particular presentation, I love giving presentations. I love talking about clinical topics. Out of all of the topics I do presentations and speak on, this is one that I do have a few more um, kind of personal examples and personal places of experience. Um, part of where this presentation stemmed from was my own personal process and understanding of myself and re-looking at my life through a lens of like, oh, that helps me understand me. So I will give some personal examples as well as client examples. And of course, any client example is, I'm not gonna tell you their name, we're gonna protect their confidentiality. And any client is usually a combination of clients so that protects their um, confidentiality even further. So let's start with what is ADHD? I think that's an important concept. It is one that it's one of those things that we kind of think we know, but do we really know? And then we'll talk about what it looks like, particularly based on gender and the experience of women. Uh, so ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, if you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you also may remember ADD. Um, ADD is no longer a diagnosis in the DSM. They removed that and put everything underneath the single heading of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, within that, there are symptoms that fall into two different categories. One category is going to be the inattentive type of behaviors. So inattentive, distractible, forgetful type of behaviors. And the other category is going to be a little bit more impulsive behaviors. So we do before we, we act, before we think, we don't think about consequences and tend to be a little bit more impulsive. People can have um, symptoms in both categories. You can be strictly inattentive type. You can be... Um, I'm not my brain's frozen for a second. You can also be the opposite side, but you also can be both. So people can have symptoms on both sides of it, just depending on how they present. Uh, one thing that I do want to stress about the language, language is such an important aspect of the work that we do. Um, unfortunately, and people even in the field talk about this, is that when we created ADHD and called it attention deficit, that that is actually a bit of a misnomer and has created this um, kind of false narrative and false image that we have within our society. So when we say attention deficit, people think that that means they can't pay attention. And that is actually the opposite of what we find and experience for those who have ADHD. 
It's not that they can't pay attention. It is that they can't regulate their attention. And that is a very distinct difference. Um, so take, for example, so I'm sitting here in my office and you notice I have a lot of things in my office. I have books, I have knickknacks. There's pictures in front of me. There's a lot of stuff happening. I'm hearing the sound of my computer making this sound. I'm hearing the sounds of my husband in the kitchen. All of these things are happening and coming into my senses. A person without ADHD can make that very quick decision in their brain. Don't pay attention to that. Don't pay attention to this. Pay attention to what she is saying, what's on the screen. They can regulate where their body and where their brain is directing attention sensorily. A person with ADHD often struggles with that regulation. They cannot stop listening to all the things. They hear the computer constantly. They hear the kitchen constantly. They see and notice and feel and notice how their chair feels underneath their skin. All of these pieces that most of the rest of us who do not have ADHD just don't even pay attention to. We've regulated our attention away to, into things that matter. So one of the struggles you'll see a lot with people with ADHD is they cannot regulate this attention. And what tends to happen is they can sometimes pay a lot of attention. And that's what we call hyperfocus. So why this is a problem and why this is a challenge goes back to our perspectives as a society. So we have a kid, we have an adult who seems to not pay attention and then all of a sudden pays attention to something that they care about that matters to them. And it comes across as a choice. It comes across as a, well, if you cared enough, then you could pay attention instead of this is actually their body and their brain striving for something different. So it's not that they can't pay attention. It's that they struggle to regulate their attention and their body has this craving and this need for dopamine. So they can very easily get into hyper-focus on certain aspects, certain tasks. And sometimes it's not even things they care about. It's just today my brain has decided that I'm going to stare at this thing about whales and I'm going to learn about whales and I'm going to learn about all the things about whales even though I need to be focusing on this presentation and preparing, I cannot turn my brain off of this topic of whales. And that is that idea of hyperfocus, an intense fixation on an interest or an activity for an extended period of time. They block out the world around them. So this can be super beneficial. However, the ability to control and regulate it is one that is rather challenging. So they can't just decide to turn on hyperfocus. But when it is there, it can be very beneficial. So again, it's neither inherently good or bad. It just depends on the context and depends on the needs. Uh, I use the example of whales because that was my personal experience. I was working on this presentation in the spring for um, literally, it's like due the next day. I'm supposed to give this presentation the next day and I cannot stop watching this documentary about whales and all this really fascinating things about how they swim and how they, they swim in circles and catch more krill. And I'm like, this is amazing. Do your presentation, Laura. Nope, for whales. That is that idea of that hyper-focus. And so when you have that kind of switching, or it looks like switching, it can lead to frustration, irritation, anger, and a lot of negativity towards children and people who are struggling with this. And it's really about their brain, not about their choices and their decision-making. So that's just one example of some of the social challenges and social struggles that you see with ADHD in general. It's not that they can't focus, it's that they can't regulate that attention. And sometimes it comes out as hyper-focus. So when we look at the bigger picture of ADHD, we think of it as this. We think of it as trouble of focusing. We think of it as fidgeting. That's kind of, we all have this probably this classic image of the kid in class, like, like kind of causing problems, being fidgety and they're not paying attention. That's what we think of when we think of ADHD. But really what it is, is this iceberg underneath. What it really is, is all these things. Difficulty in maintaining relationships, depression, hyperfixation, executive dysfunction, poor impulse control, rejection sense of dysphoria. Many of these we will talk about here in just a little bit. Is it all or nothing? Chronic unemployment. All of these pieces that stem from these challenges. So you think about it's not just I can't focus. It's not just that I fidget, fidget. It's all of these pieces. I'm overwhelmed by the sounds. I am. I cannot pay attention to my friends and my relationships. And so I end up not paying attention to them and make them angry and frustrated and they don't want to talk to me anymore. 
there's this push pull of all of these pieces. Um, this is one forgetting to eat, sleep and go to the bathroom. I always give the example of my husband. I have run into this. He, I leave for work. I come home at the end of the day. It's been eight hours. The man has not left what he is doing. He's been hyper-focused on this one activity all day long. And he's not eaten, gone to the bathroom, done anything. He doesn't realize it till I walk in the door. He's like, oh, it's five o'clock already. And he's like, what have I been doing with my day? I'm like, I don't know. What have you been hyper-focused on? So that can create a variety of issues and frustrations and relationships and work in a lot of places. Uh, so ADHD is all of these pieces. And that's before we even get to the conversation about women. Uh, so when we look at the prevalence, this is one of the most diagnosed disorders in children um, today in the United States, about 9.4%. So about 10% of children between the ages of two and 17 have been diagnosed with ADHD. So about 1.6 billion. So quite a large number of children. And as we're, as we're getting to, boys are much more likely to receive a diagnosis of ADHD than a girl. Um, almost by, I think, by 50% more boys than girls. Uh, when I was putting this presentation together and telling people about what it is and why I wanted to talk about it, I had a lot of people who said, ADHD, isn't that a boy? Why are you talking about it with women or girls? They don't get that. There's this misnomer, there's this myth, there's this inaccuracy in our society about what this looks like. And this is why we're here, while we're talking about that. So why is that? Why do we see this difference in diagnosis? Well, there's a couple of reasons and we're gonna expand on these here shortly. But in general, a lot of it comes down to a couple pieces. One to start off with is research on ADHD uses a male sample. Uh, so this is something we see in, in um, both psychology as well as the medical fields um, and even in safety and business fields. A lot of research um, is done on a male standardized sample. Um, and that we are discovering is not representative of our entire population. Uh, we see this, for example, not in not only in ADHD, um, heart disease um, and heart attacks. Heart attacks present differently in many cases in women than they do in men. Not every woman gets the pressure in her chest and the shooting pain down her arm. Women oftentimes have more of a um, like acid reflux kind of feeling, which leads them to not recognize the signs of heart attack and leads to higher rates and incidences of heart attack and death because we didn't miss, we missed the signs. And this happens in many other places as well. Um, you see this in um, just recently in the, I was reading about um, crash chest dummies. This is a random factoid I think is fascinating. We didn't start using female shaped crash chest dummies until 2003. So you think about the years and the decades of time we have spent testing cars for safety in car crashes. And we didn't use a female shaped crash test dummy. And that it matters because women have different centers of gravity, they have different bone structure, and that is going to shape and change how those instruments and those protectants work inside of a car. And that's in the last 20 years. So there's more and more and more examples of that. In ADHD, it's no different. Early research in the 80s and the 90s on ADHD used male samples. So we described symptoms that we saw in boys not recognizing that it was also happening in girls. And so we're starting to shift as a field, as a science, as a society, in looking at how do these things present differently in women and expanding our understanding and experience. So we'll talk about that difference in symptom presentation here in just a second. Um, the societal expectations between boys and girls is very different. The expectations socially, the expectation in terms of communication, relationship building, um, begins at a very early age. The girls have different expectations to live underneath than we do put on boys. And this stems from a lot of myths and biases related to boys and girls and differences in gender. Because of these societal expectations, girls tend to be better at masking symptoms. Girls tend to be better at recognizing what they're supposed to be doing, understanding more of the social structures and the social rules. So they realize I need to be this and they put on a mask and they hide what's happening underneath them. You don't get that as much with boys. And often when we do see symptoms, we describe or assign them to a different disorder. We assign it as anxiety. We assign it as depression. We assign it as something entirely different and not see it as an 
attention deficit disorder. So let's talk about what those gender differences are in symptom presentation. Okay, so in general, and again, this is in general, in general, men or boys tend to be diagnosed more with hyperactive or impulsive symptoms. So these are gonna be your very visual, very clear cut, what we think of as your classic ADHD. I can't sit still, I'm up, moving around, I can't focus, I can't do anything, but like move, 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 move. That has a much more outward appearance, much more visual appearance, and honestly is much more annoying to try and deal with and is kind of that classic idea of the, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. That's a little bit of what's happening with this. Girls and women tend to be diagnosed more with inattentive symptoms. So what this might look like is a little bit more of a lack of focus. Uh, they don't pay attention to details as much. They're not as organized. They struggle to listen and remember things. So we think about, you have a kid, you have two kids in front of you, and you got one kid is up running around the room in the classroom doing this, doing that, doing this, doing that. And you have the other kid who has forgot their papers and forgot their pencil and left out assignments and left things blank. One, we can see as ADHD, oh, this is a problem. The other, we see as character flaws, as um, you haven't put enough effort forth. And that then fuels some of the other additional symptoms that we see. And that, oh, what's wrong with me? I need to hide that I forgot stuff. I need to hide that I don't have this. Um, I have a couple of memories from my own childhood. I remember I got a week grounded. I grounded for a week from my bike, which is a big deal to me in first grade, uh, because I didn't complete my homework. And what I remember, I remember this conversation with my mother um, because it wasn't like I didn't finish the bottom half. Like I had homework and it was just randomly not done. Like question two, question seven, like it made no sense as to which questions I didn't answer. I just randomly left blank or started and didn't finish. And I remember getting in trouble. Like, Laura, you need to pay more attention. You should, how could you have missed this? Did you not understand? I know you know the answer to this. And my mother, bless her heart, she was like, I don't understand why you didn't do it. And looking back and understanding myself now through this lens of ADHD, I was like, of course, that's what was happening. I knew I was distracted. I got a lack of focus and I missed the details. And so from that point forward, I started to think of myself as absent-minded and think of myself as forgetful. I mean, I was the kid in class who like oftentimes didn't have paper and pencil. And eventually I stopped asking my friends or people around me, if I could borrow a pencil or a piece of paper because they kept making me feel bad for forgetting it. So I just stopped carrying one and just didn't worry about taking notes because I didn't want to bring attention to the fact that I forgot it again. Um, and I felt it starts to internalize. And this is one of the challenges that women and girls will often experience is these things that are often more inattentive. They get put in categories of character flaws, starts to tear down their sense of self and their sense of ability. And they start to internalize these messages of, I'm lazy, I don't care, I'm absent-minded, I'm this, I'm that. And we end up with anxiety and depression in adolescence. And so it comes out as symptoms later on, but it really started as a lack of focus and inattentive. It's really about ADHD and not about anything else, not a character flaw. Um, so that you will find girls who are hyperactive you will find boys who are inattentive, but in general, girls tend to fall more in that inattentive symptom category, leading to a very different experience and bias towards them and their behaviors. The other piece that you're going to see is even if they do have the more um, hyperactive presentation, it looks different. Um, so for example, um, differences in symptom presentation. So hyperactivity in a boy might look like this picture. Got this kid sitting in a chair, you know, he's playing with his sock, clearly not paying attention to what he's doing, fidgeting. I mean, I can think of, I can think of the kids in my class and the boys that had ADHD when I was a kid and the things they would do. And that was certainly not me. I was never the up running around the classroom kid. Um, but what happens for girls is their hyperactivity becomes internal. So instead of being hyperactive physically, running around da, 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 here and there, they are hyperactive mentally. So what looks like quiet, calm, doing her paper 
inside of her head is just this constant stream of thoughts. It's just this constant running. So the hyperactivity isn't physical, it's verbal, it's mental, it's internal that comes out and looks very, very different. So many girls with ADHD are often hyperverbal. Um, they will often talk very fast, talk very quickly. Um, there was a running joke in high school, me and my best friend. Um, people were like, it sounds like the two of you talk to each other at sonic levels. Because the her and I would just, and half the group couldn't understand us and stop crying. Um, because we were very hyperverbal. And that creates challenges with relationships. If you are in a group of people and you're the person who interrupts people, you're the person who talks too fast, you're the person who talks too much, you start to get a little bit more ostracized. You kind of get pushed out. Um, you don't get the same responses that you get from other people because of this hyperverbal and internal hyperactivity. It just looks like, well, you want to talk about yourself or you're selfish or you're just, you know, too busy. And so what, what really is, is underneath all of that is these pieces of symptoms. It's really ADHD. So for a lot of girls, they can often hold it together decently well through elementary school. Um, they can mask, they can cover, they can, they know I'm supposed to sit and listen and do my homework. I'm supposed to be this. And they create all of these systems and all of these coping skills that help them like cobble together the ability to pass and do well and make it through school and not get noticed and not feel bad about themselves. But then you hit elementary school, you hit middle school and you have the social dynamic that shifts. And all of a sudden, not only do they have school to try and manage, they now have female social groups to try to manage and you have the onset of adolescence and you throw all that into the mix and those coping skills start to fall apart. And what worked to be work in school doesn't work with friends and they start to get disconnected and ostracized, which again, leads to depression, leads to anxiety, um, leads to substance use. It can also lead to thoughts of suicide. Um, so what's coming out, what parents are seeing is they're seeing a kid who's sad and anxious and using drugs and involved with the wrong kids. And they start trying to treat those things when really the underneath and underlying is the mask of ADHD. That's really, truly what's happening. The other piece we see, again, along the same lines, um, particularly nowadays with women and more and more women in their 20s and 30s being diagnosed with ADHD is they managed their coping skills, cobbled together, made it through. You know, they were able to graduate. They were able to function to an extent. They found a way to make it work, to hide from the world. And now they're in a professional career. They might be married and they might not have children. And so when we start looking at that, that is where our symptoms and our coping skills start falling apart. So now you're trying to manage work and kids and a household and your job and yourself and all the things and the skills that worked for school don't apply to all the others and it overwhelms our coping systems. And then you're starting to see these symptoms come out and these struggles come out. Um, and so that's why some of which we're starting to see this today is that we're getting more of an understanding, but also... Um, the change in system and structure that is leading to their coping skills no longer working. So we have for women, for girls, oftentimes more likely to be inattentive. If they do have hyperactivity, it tends to be more internal, tends to be more verbal versus physical. And then back to that idea that inattentive. So they make careless mistakes. They're not listening, easily distracted. They daydream they do all of poor time management or planning. And you can see how these type of skills, when you're in elementary school, you may not use these all to this degree because your parents help control certain things. The mask, the coping skills make it function. But if you're now the primary breadwinner, you're the person trying to run the household and try to work, all of our skills fall apart. And it looks like you just can't manage, you're just a bad mom, you're, um, what girl I'm looking for, you know, absent-minded, you're uncaring, you're unforgiving, all of these negative pieces that then fuel that internal experience. And so this is sort of how we see some of these presentations appear. It's understanding that it's not depression and anxiety and feeling like you're a bad mom. It's actually time management. It is ADHD. It is the inattentiveness that you're coming out, showing up in my classroom and in my um, therapy office as anxiety about life but is really underneath an ADHD. 
Um, beyond those pieces, we have the gender norms. So we have the symptom presentation that is different, that shows up in a little bit different ways. And then, like I mentioned before, the idea of the the gender norms and what is expected of women and what is expected of girls in our society and how they do tend to have a little bit better social knowledge so they know what they're supposed to do, what you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to present. And so we have this mask, we have these societal expectations and when we don't meet them, it's seen as a character flaw and people desperately want to please and so they do their best to please. So they don't feel that sense of rejection and anxiety. Um, so it covers up those pieces. I had a lot of this presentation started in COVID because I started doing private practice and I had all these young girls coming to me in their mid twenties for anxiety who then started saying, Hey, I saw on TikTok that I think I'm ADHD. And I of course rolled my eyes and I was like, TikTok, really? Well, let me research that. And as in researching it and learning it and understanding about it and understanding them, this is what I started to find and what I started to find for myself. Um, but they would talk about this desire to, to fit in. They're like, I can't, people can't know that I live my life with my clothes in piles in my house. I can't have my, my new boyfriend over to my home because I can't let him see how I live because I have to present this put together um, image of myself, which is really just a, a front for all of those pieces because I know what I'm supposed to be and I can't make that work. Um, so these gender norms really also push us in those directions and we get really good at masking what's happening um, without recognizing that we're actually covering up our symptoms. So let me give one specific example, particularly related to character flaws and a symptom. And that is this one. That is uh, time blindness. Uh, so time blindness is a um, specific symptom related to ADHD and it can occur in other disorders as well. Um, but the idea behind time blindness is that it is a person who struggles to sense the passage of time. So has it been one minute? Has it been 10 minutes? Has it been half an hour? Um, time is a very abstract concept and people have varying degrees and skill sets related to being able to know how long something has gone on for. Um, I think about my mother-in-law is a neonatal NICU nurse and the woman could tell you like, how long it's been down to the minute, down to the second with like kind of freaky accuracy because that's part of her job. That's part of the skill set that she's developed over time as a nurse and probably one of the skill sets that biologically has made her a good nurse. So it's like a chicken or the egg question. But either way, she can tell you it's been one minute and she's exactly correct. I, as someone who struggles with time blindness, could tell you I have absolutely no idea. I It's been five minutes, right? Nope, it's been 30 it's been only one minute, right? Nope, it's been an hour. Oh, okay, this is a problem. So the issue with time blindness is when you in, when you struggle to recognize how long something has been, you then also struggle to estimate and plan properly. So you people will over or underestimate how long it has been since something has passed. So I'm getting rest, I'm taking a shower. Okay, it's been, I've been in the shower five minutes. No, you've been in the shower 15. And you would think that, 10 minutes doesn't really make a huge difference. But when you take that one experience and apply it to showering and getting dressed and brushing your teeth and packing your bags and driving in the car and getting where you need to go, all of a sudden, five minutes here, five minutes there, five minutes here, off on your estimation equals being late a lot, um, being late often, being extremely late, um, very much creating a negative sense of time and time management. And so what happens is then people start to internalize this about themselves. Um, and then we, our society, I'm going to, so this next slide I'm going to show is one, I'll be honest, like boils my blood to no end um, for a variety of reasons, because this speaks to exactly the idea of the character flaw. So people with ADHD who have time blindness are often either late all the time or early all the time in an attempt to compensate for their inability to keep track of that time. Early is can be problematic. I have shown up very early and very awkwardly to parties because they're not ready for people to show up. So there are social downsides to being early. Um, and I also, more often than not, I am late. If anybody works with me or knows me, I work very, very hard to be on time. Um, I have a lot of my own personal judgments about myself related to my time blindness and my inability to be on time. 
I had a friend in high school who one time told me, oh, Laura, I tell you like half an hour before I actually think we're going to meet. So that way you show up on time. And I laughed about it and I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. But internally, like my soul died because I realized people saw my flaw and I tried to hide that. That's that masking piece that we do. Um, so I had a friend, I don't know how to say friend, person I know on Facebook um, who shared this post. And I put this in here because I think it speaks to exactly what we're talking about with that perspective on character flaw. Punctuality, consistently being on time is the product of proper planning, personal discipline, and respect for other people's times. Making a habit of being late demonstrates none of these things and is often a sign of patchy priorities and selflessness, selfishness. Um, habitual lateness says my time is more valuable than yours. Um, learn to be reliable and a person of integrity by adopting the discipline necessary to be on time. Um, I, I said, this is not a friend. This is a coworker, acquaintance, person I know on Facebook. Um, and I'll be very honest, my own personal experience of having read this um, made me want to die a little bit inside. Um, and I think a little part of me did. If it had been a really good friend, I probably would have died a little bit more. Um, not because I disagree with being on time is not important. It's because this language of when you do this, this means this. When you are late, you this means this about you. You're negative. You don't care. You think you're more important and puts a lot of negativity on it. You take this concept and then look at the lens of time blindness and look at the lens of this is a person who is late, not because they don't care or don't have priorities, but because their brain doesn't work in a way that helps them. That's sort of like being mad at your friend in a wheelchair for not going up the stairs. Why can't, if you just try it hard enough, you can get up the stairs. What's wrong with you? How can you not do that? But by that languaging, it pushes and pulls at that symptoms. Uh, I just saw, I saw it recently. My lateness is a result of trying to do 20 things at one time. Absolutely. It is that push-pull of trying to do all the stuff, trying to juggle all the things, trying to manage time, and then our brain just doesn't work the way we want it to. And so it's that push-pull, but recognizing it's not about selfishness. It's not about not caring. It's about symptoms and diagnosis and challenges and experiences. And it is no different. Saying something like that to a person of ADHD is no different than telling your friend in a wheelchair, I'm mad at you for not walking up the stairs because you needed to try harder. The same push-pull. Um, things that don't require talent and being on time. That, oh, things that don't require talent. Yes. Oh my gosh. And I, also, and I, I think a lot about time because it's very much something I struggle with very, very deeply. Um, and it's one of the things that helped me understand my ADHD in much more ways is recognizing, I mean, I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to be on time um, and the, trying to do the mental math of this is how long this takes and this is how long that takes. And no matter how I, hard I try, I manage to forget one thing. There's one aspect that got left out. Um, one piece. Oh, another great example. I love that. So another post about a symptom I experienced, audio processing delays, saying, huh? And then answering it as a moral. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, that, and I think, so thank you for all those who've met, dropped in the chat. We'll, both acknowledging that this is something we see these things and how much it hurts us and why I point that out, not just to say, oh, it's okay, you're late, Laura, that's all right. It's to really show that this is about seeing people for who they are and seeing them as their strengths as well as their challenges and recognizing the challenges are not just about something wrong with them. It's about how their body and their brain works and how their brain functions. Um, so as we, this is just, there's many examples of this. Um, this other example I will give is called rejection sensitive dysphoria. Um, so this is another symptom, underlying symptom often found in ADHD, oftentimes very heightened in women. Um, so what this is, this is an extreme emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the perception a person has been rejected or criticized. And so this is, uh, I want to stress like, this is not a like, oh, I think you think bad of me. It's a like deep hurt because it's like a part of your soul dies when you think that you have been rejected or criticized. A um, couple of examples I will give for this that I, I can think of for myself. Just if you may, and, and again, this, this still bothers me and I'm still upset about this. And this speaks to this rejection sense of dysphoria. A few weeks ago, I was at the mall of, in Overland Park and I was struggling to find a parking space. 
and I found an open spot and there were people next to the spot, like that was parked right next to it, that still had the door open and were kind of like getting in the way of like me parking in this space. And I stopped and I waited and I figured, oh, they would notice me and they would do as most people do, which is like shut the door or like scoot around or like squish in so I could take the park, the parking spot. And they did not. They just looked at me and then kept doing whatever they were doing in the car, continuing to take up this extra spot. And I made the decision and I still regret this decision. This is so bad. I still feel about it. I decided, well, fine, that's a big enough space. I'll just scoot in on the other side. It's okay. So I chose to then still move into the space, making sure not to hit them, of course, but taking the spot. And I realized as soon as I stopped and parked that that was the wrong decision, because now I'm stressed about how these random strangers feel about me. And I got out of the car and they were mouthing at me. They didn't speak at me, but they were speaking to each other. Things like, oh, geez, who's so desperate to go shopping? And like making like snide little comments about the fact that I parked. And I will not kid you, it ruined my freaking shopping experience. The whole time I was inside the mall with my husband and my small child buying Legos and getting things that were fun. I was like, oh my gosh, those like random people were mad at me. Oh, what did I? And I was like regretting like every decision I made. I should have just parked far away. I should have just kept going. I should have done this. I should have, should I should have, should I should have. And again, it's I don't know. I don't know their names. They're like random teenagers over in Jesus. I'm never going to see them again, but I am deeply, I'm still upset. This is three weeks ago, and I'm still upset about this situation. That is an example of this rejection sensitive dysphoria, an extreme emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the thought that you think someone is rejecting or criticizing you. So you take this concept and you apply it to time blindness, the negativity the struggles with the internal, the lack of friendship, all of those pieces come together and it looks like anxiety. It looks like depression. It looks like social stuff. But in reality, what is underlying all of it is actually ADHD, um, particularly in women and their experiences. So this is um, all of these pieces um, connect back to how we were um, how we're trained, how we are masking, how we are trying to hide who we are and the struggles that we have. And that can affect our lives negatively. I'll give one other example of this and then I'll continue on. Um, just recently, just this week, so I work in workforce, okay? I, you know, that's why I'm here. I work in workforce and we're having conversations in my organization about workforce development and what we need to do to improve. And one of those things being, we need to do evaluations for our um, classes and our courses. And I know we need to do that. I know that's very important. And I know that the minute I see an evaluation that says, Laura talked too fast and Laura didn't, didn't seem organized, that I'll die inside and I will never be able to give that presentation again. And I know that about myself. And I also know that's important information for me to receive to be better. And so it's that push pull of that rejection sensitive dysphoria. Um, and I was, I did what I did. This is what, and this is what I did. Everyone makes their own choices. I made a decision to share that with my, um, my both my boss and my coworkers. I said, "This is my struggle. I know we need this. This is how I'm going to handle it, and I know I'm going to handle it this way. And I need help. Can we come up with some ways to either soften the blow, use some summaries, do some things to give the information, to give the support, but also recognizing that it's going to hurt us, and it's going to cause problems and make it be an issue." Um. And so, oh, thank you guys. I appreciate that in, in the chats. Um, sharing the mistakes went straight to putting all the pressure on you. Absolutely. Um, great question. Uh, I actually do, and I'll be very honest, um, person who put in the question, do you have information on what co-occurrence of ADHD and ASD, so um, autism? That I honestly do not. That is a piece I need to add to my, um, to my reading and to my understanding is that combination with autism. Um, as a therapist and a provider who's worked almost exclusively with adults, the autism is not something I have a ton of information on. I do know with autism, a lot of it stems from those social interactions and misreading social cues. Um, and so you're gonna see some of that kind of combination. You're gonna have the misreading of social cues, the misreading of social norms and standards. And then you add to that the lack of focus or the hyper-focus on certain areas 
and that can cause a variety of different um, kind of combinations. But for the moment, in this presentation, I don't have a ton of additional information to that. Um, there's like, yeah, much like ADHD, we're still learning a lot about how autism um, shows up in women. Um, we're still learning a lot more about autism and how it shows up in boys, let alone in women or children or men, women. Um, but that's definitely, I've seen more and more of that pop up in uh, the research I've been doing for ADHD. Um, but rejection, sensitive dysphoria, all of these pieces. And I'm trying very hard to pay attention to my time because I want to give you a chance to ask other questions as well. Um, so what do we do? Why are we seeing this shift? So I mentioned and I kind of alluded to this in a couple of different places. Um, what, so what we're seeing is science, advances in neuroscience. A better understanding of the brain. You've probably heard the language neurodivergent. Um, that is kind of becoming what feels like a buzzword, um, but is really more of reflective our understanding of how the brain works and what is neurotypical and what is not neurotypical. And recognizing that these standards and these structures and these models that early neuroscience has created do not represent every single person's experience. And we need to expand those models and expand that understanding to better represent the population as a whole, not just this initial setup. So neuroscience advances have done a lot for the push-pull into understanding neurodivergence, understanding neurotypical, and seeing these small and subtle shifts. You know, we're now, if we'll take autism, for example, you know, we used to start to see symptoms of autism around two to three. Now we're able to see them even under like 12 years, 12 months of age. So we're able to see those symptoms earlier due to some of these advances. Um, I also think it's not on the slide and I'll be honest, this is just my supposition. I also think we're starting to see shifts in treatment is because we're seeing shifts in who is running laboratories and who is in charge. Um, and that's simply because you're, you're hiring more women, we're hiring more diversely. Science is becoming a less male dominated field, um, which brings to it a new perspective and a new understanding. Um, and no shade to men. Men have their own perspective and their own point of view, and that has served us well and has been important to have. And it's also important to add the other perspectives. And so I think part of what you're seeing, you know, take for me, take my example, I was born in 1981. So I'm in my 40s now. Um, so you're finding women who are of my age or of my generation who went to college in the 70s and 80s are now moving into positions of power where they're not just the research assistant, they're the researcher, their name, they're the first title, they're the first author. They're the ones making the decisions because they've been working their way up through the field. And I think you're starting to see that not just in science, but in a lot of places in our society because people are looking to hire more diversely and looking to see these different perspectives. So I think that's part of why you're seeing this shift. Our understanding of neuroscience, the increase of diversity in science, and also where science is going, what we're learning about things. There's a big, been a very big push in the field towards positive psychology, very much moving away from the medical model, moving into recovery and strengths-based perspectives and seeing less about how to fix people and more about how to grow with them. I was at a conference this year where they talked about this movement from medical model, which is what's wrong with you, to trauma-informed care, which is what happened to you, to the new and next phase, which is resilience and strengths-based, which is what is right with you, that we're starting to move through this. You know, ACEs led us to trauma-informed care, and now trauma-informed care is starting to move us into resilience. And that's where we're seeing some of these shifts in this discussion and this conversation. And then this is very much where I stem from and where I come from. Um, as uh, I put in my bio that I believe in the beauty of all people and we all have something to bring to the table. And this is very much where we are moving with treatment is it's not about being broken. It's not about needing to be fixed. It's about finding a way that works for you and understanding how you function and working within that life that they want. That is very much that perspective. Um, I will get to those questions in a second. So this is the movement and we start looking at treatment and we start looking at um, what can we do to help people? It's really coming from this perspective. It's not about you need to be more on time by doing it this way. It's about, I wanna help you be on time so you don't lose your job. How, what can we do for you to help you be more on time that works with your brain and your understanding? Um, so instead of, this is, and this is the importance of it, Instead of using neurotypical coping skills, we're going to start to look at neurodivergent coping skills and looking within what works for you. And it doesn't matter. That's how things should be. 
what works for you. I had so many of my clients that we would do work with ADHD and they would feel bad about it. Why, why do I have to have stuff in front of me? Why do I need to see it? Because you have some object permanent struggles because of your ADHD. If you don't see a thing, then you forget you have it and you don't think to use it. So we're going to create a world in which you can see your stuff and you're going to create it so you can see it, so you can use it. I can't really see it, but I've started to use um, translucent um, office organizers um, so that I don't, I no longer have things in drawers because the minute it goes into a drawer, it's like it doesn't exist anymore. And I forget I have it. And then I either buy it again three or four times or I never use it and just do it the hard way. So thinking along those lines, those are those ideas of how we move into what can we do? Coping skills. So here's a few examples of coping skills. Um, using timers to build in stopping points. Um, so I talked about time blindness. I talked about that struggle of like knowing how long it has been. Um, so for a lot of people with ADHD and time blindness, it's about setting up different timers. Um, I could almost probably show you what my phone looks like. Thank God for phones. They come in very handy. Uh, so you can see here's my alarms. I literally have like pages and pages and pages and pages of alarms. I don't make a new one. I just find the one that fits the time that works for me. And so whenever I have to get up in the morning, there's the wake time, there's the get out of bed time. And then there is the five minute timer that runs in the background that tells me it's been five minutes. So I have some semblance of where I'm at in the process and in the system. Um, so that is one way. So you build in timers to give you stopping points. You build in timers to give you that sense of time so that you are not lost in hyper-focus and that you're not lost in that, um, what, how long things are taking. Um, turning off notifications. Okay, so there is no rule that says you must get a notification when someone likes your Facebook page. There is no rule that says you must get a notification when you have received a new email. Nothing that says you must do that. Um, so changing those things, turning off the notifications because the notifications pull away our attention. And for someone who already has a hard time paying attention and a hard time regulating that attention of what needs to be focused on right now, turning off notifications can be a huge deal. And then setting aside time to complete those tasks. So you time block and then you change your notifications. Using color coding. Okay, so we go back to the idea that people who have ADHD struggle with regulation of attention and they struggle with, they want things to have interest. So nothing says you have to write a planner in black and white. Use color. Color code things it makes it visually interesting. It also makes it very easy to spot what you're looking for and keeps attention and keeps focus. Um, so using color coding in um, calendars, in emails and personal life use color coding because it provides visual interest and visual stimulation that helps keep your attention and focus. Um, in cup is what I'm kind of a fan of. So in cup is a um, acronym, you know, in psychology, we love acronyms and that stands for interest, novelty, challenge, urgency, and passion. People who have ADHD struggle with attention and regulation. And so they need those hits of dopamine. And so they need to do things that fit these topics. The more interesting, the more novel, the more challenging, the more urgent, and the more passion they have, the more likely they are to be able to focus on that task. And that then allows them to accomplish it. So I'll give you an example. How am I doing time? Okay. Uh, one example, when I was doing this presentation, I made the mistake of setting a fake deadline. I was like, all right, Laura, you need to have this done by Tuesday. And it was a completely made up fake deadline. I was trying to get myself to be done ahead of time uh, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? That's what you're supposed to do. Get things done ahead of time so you can prepare for it better. Um, I made a fake deadline. And the minute I made a fake deadline, I had zero motivation to do anything. I was super excited, super passionate, very pa um, excited about this presentation. The minute I made a fake deadline, it was no longer novel. It was no longer challenging. There was no more urgency for it. I knew it wasn't real. And so I didn't do it. And then I made a new fake deadline and it killed it even further. So eventually the very first time I did this presentation and I'll be very honest, there's shame in me for even telling you this. Um, I was literally standing at the front of the room, finishing my PowerPoint as I was getting ready to give this presentation. Um, I'm not proud of that fact. Um, and knowing what I know about ADHD and about myself, I get what I did. 
I get why I did that. I'm not proud of it. I wish it was different. It still was a great presentation. That's what you could tell me. Um, but at the same time, I was like, oh, I totally screwed that up for myself. So I have to know I need to create things. I need to find a way to have it be interesting, have it be novel, give a challenge, give urgency. People with ADHD are great in a crisis because they can, it's immediately novel, challenging and urgent. And all of a sudden they are like run to the rescue. They're great in crisis. Long-term plans, projects, long-term plans can be rather challenging because it loses these pieces for them. And last but certainly not least, exercise. As much as all of us hate it, exercise is really important. It makes a huge difference. The boost of endorphins, the boost of dopamine, the movement, all of that makes a very huge difference and helps support and give direction and um, handling what we need for our experience. Okay, now I apologize. I ran through that like bad out of hell, but I see a whole bunch of comments in the chat that I want to be sure to touch on. Okay, here we go. We're reverting here. Okay. I appreciate that. The people at the mall are um are are, are still liking me. I appreciate that. That's helpful. The shift and recovery treatment, absolutely. And what I'm hearing more and more. So I wasn't diagnosed with adult ADHD until 42 at your first office job. Overwhelmed, unable to maintain focus, easily distracted. Um, finishing one task completely before moving on to the next, keeping up with paperwork, everything. Oh, you're a, a children's teacher. Oh, yeah. Because you're constantly moving. You're constantly busy. There's always 500 different things going and trying to just do one thing at a time. It's like you just like your soul dies a little bit. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, tra trauma is a great example. Um, so trauma, it always like throws a kink in things. Um how a person might know if their symptoms are really, yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, so I would think, and this is, again, I'm kind of off the cuff a little bit here. Uh, so trauma is going to upend our typical development. Um, I would think if the trauma is going to be more related to like those reoccurring thoughts and feelings um, around the trauma, what we learned, our behaviors that we learned to then cope afterwards, and so we would have to look at, is this behavior stemming from coping through trauma or is this behavior pre-existing? Um, and if it happened really early in childhood, it might be very hard to tease that apart. Um, you could then probably even argue that trauma led to the ADHD. Like it gets intermingled and intertwined together. Um, I see Andrea popped on. He's probably going to give me a timer here. Oh, I like neuro spicy. That's lovely. Um, keeping things in the fridge where you can see it. Absolutely. All of those things make a huge difference. I'm totally stealing neuro spicy. I think that is fabulous. Um, so a couple of things to give you. Cute stationery, absolutely. Totally love the cute stationery. It's very required. Keeps me going. I have to use lots of colors. And I think, and I, what I, I want to stress that I see some people calling, commenting about this. Whatever works, if it works for you, that's great. Like having to let go of how it should be and being what works for you is going to make the most difference. Uh, oh, great questions. Okay. Sorry, Andrea, you have to like cut me off, like pull me off with like a, uh, you know, like old fashioned stick. No, you're uh, good. It's so much good information. We may so have to do a part two, Laura. I always need a part two. Okay, so in order to, yes, those who want to read further about it, mm -hmm. I have way too many options. Um, I highly recommend the book, Your Brain's Not Broken. It's a book specifically written by a therapist. Um, who has her own experience of ADHD is written for the lay person um, about what they can do and cope with ADHD. Um, so there is that one. Your brain's not broken. Um, this one is brand new. I just bought women in ADHD. Very excited about this one. Uh, one of the classics driven to distraction. Also an excellent ADHD book. We can always send these out in the, the list. And there's another one I just bought called neurodivergence. I'm written by a woman about um, her experience with ADHD and uh, neurodivergence. So there are several. I also highly recommend the website Additude, A-D-D, Itude. It is a, um, ADHD, an ADHD uh, organization that publishes a online website that has a variety of resources, a magazine, articles, a lot of information about ADHD, not just for women, but in general. Um, and I think that's my time, right? Yeah, yeah, we got to wrap it up. Okay. That's really well, thank you. I appreciate everyone for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of it.
Um, and Andrea is going to do her, her wrap up here. Yep. Yes. Thank you so much, Laura. This was really informative. Um, and uh, I did drop in the chat the link for the certificate of attendance. Make sure you use the password that's there uh, in order to access that. And this was recorded so you can go back and watch it again, or if there were certain things that you wanted to grab off of the, the information that she had on the slide, uh, you can do that. And uh, please note that our next webinar is the second, um, the second Thursday of November, and the topic is going to be on veterans transition back into the civilian world. So that's going to be a really interesting topic, uh, especially given that that will be the second week of November, so right around Veterans Day. Uh, thanks again for joining us, everyone, and we hope to see you again in the future. Have a good rest thank of you. the day. Thank and you. thank you, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.